began with me there the organized crime mentality because it really wasn't revolutionary yet it was organized crime still it was um i started saying damn i i had been i think i was having like an epiphany because like like i said i had been introduced through Tiki and them through y'all antics through y'all culture as a crib before sets would even like you know what i mean there were clicks but there weren't sets you feel me and so then when my set became it was like they gave me a reason to set trip you feel me and the more you put a label in front of you the more you'll cling to it as not only strength but as a excuse why you don't have to do nothing or he might be a crip but he's from such and such a hood so, oh yeah yeah he a crip but i don't fuck with them dudes oh yeah he he a crip but he ain't no gangster or well, he's from neighborhood but see the thing is when the 60s would be at the parties with us and we'd be at the party with the hoovers and we'd be hollering out hood it wasn't no antagonistic contradiction there the contradiction was pliable yes you from 60s and i'm from a trade and you from but we all crips that's the strongest point you feel me these exist inside this crib that's what makes this shit so fucking hard and you can't dance like me fool you start see walking and i mean it's just it's friendly competition but then um when um friends become enemies it's uh it's dangerous because um you, you know Man, man, I know this dude. I hated his house. Now y'all want to go shoot this dude's house up? And his mother's in there? I mean, shit like that. You know, dilemmas, dilemmas. You start running across, when well, you see this dude, you know this dude's name just came up in some of your homie shit. That he might've been involved on since Mike got killed. And you see him, but you and this dude grew up from the sandbox. And you just let him pass. It's just like, War is elastic, man. It's uh, politics are elastic. Love is elastic. That shit, it, it, it stretches and it accommodates. You know what I mean? Like, like when the crack epidemic came, and um, and um, we went from being broke and piecing up on a court, and having a stolen car, getting two or three dollars worth of gas, and somebody's legitimate car drive all day, or having a stolen car. We went from that to having an abundance of shit. And so the homies who had the most, the, the homies who didn't have, were gonna rob them. So they didn't come around. So when they didn't come around, the homies who didn't have nothing felt the homies abandoned them. Now they really after them. But the homies who are balling will unite with anybody from any hood that got the same amount of money as them. It's about the war on poverty. But it's a Ponzi scheme. Because they ain't kicking nothing back down. They going further up. And will close the door and weld the shut on you. Dudes you grew up with. That money, when the money came, it created classism. It created capitalism in the hood. It created an economic disparity that wasn't just between adults and youth. Like when I was youth, when I was young. Only adults could be in the, in the drug game. What no young dealers. Everybody, you had to buy your commercial weed, four finger bags, in the wax bag with all the seeds from an adult. You know what I mean? Wasn't no kids running around with, with coke in their pocket or, or heroin in their pocket or pills. It wasn't like that. And, and then certain areas got certain drugs. I'm so glad that in my area, heroin didn't come through there. All right, all right. What's up, people, man? There we go. I'm always opening with the introductions. And I remember what he's talking about, about how he spoke about how they didn't allow kids to deal in drugs, to kids even be around some of these adult conversations, even though it is sort of a contra Well, it's not sort of a contradiction when you hear about him running with Tookie and them as a young kid. But you got to remember, Tookie and them were young teenagers at that time, but the adults really didn't allow that. And one of my proofs, 
proofs and what I remember, I'm going to play this from Dead Homies. If you ever watched the old L.A. gang documentary, one of the first to like really, really shake the ground with this L.A. gang documentary stuff was Dead Homies in the clothes. Here go my homies in them uncle. My name is Craig, Big Mo from Harlem. We'll give a shout out to the homies in the hood. Rest in peace, the baby bro, G, G Rock, and all the dead homies. Rest in peace. So, so the reason why I bring that up because Big Craig is another cat who uh, really let me know like where they stood with with kids being around and shit. So you know the gang, you like like I said, I grew up around original Crib Cat. So when they up there and they little combos and they groups because I knew them. You know, you little kid, you know they chase after you, may smack you and play fight. I'm thinking they, you know, it's one of them type of days. I'm up there playing around. He like, man, I told you get the hell up, get up from over here. You go over there and go play. And I'm thinking they playing, man, forget you fool doing all this shit. I'm over there messing with them, doing all this faking like I'm walking over there. And he ran over there, grabbed my little ass, slammed me on the concrete on my head. He done that shit twice in my life and let me know when they over there talking about what they talking about and they telling you get away from here, they meant that shit. And it's also been times where some shit about to go down and they'll say some shit, get y'all asses up in the house. Y'all can't play today. Go in. It ain't even no question. We know what's going on. Same thing they had in, I think this is after the riots where they had the event up at uh, Jesse Owens Park for Juneteenth and the celebration up there. We just get there. They got carnivals, Ice Cube, Camus, a bunch of cats out there performing. It's down there every gang in LA up at the damn park because it's around the peace treaty time and shit. And uh, I mean, we up in there. It's a bunch of us barely just getting to the damn park. And when one of the cats from my neighborhood, they seen us like red, all y'all get the fuck, y'all gotta go. We young kids too, we might've been 10, 11. Y'all gotta get up out of here. And man, I ain't even asked. I already knew it was about to go down because I see all these gangs up in the damn park. They all on the mic saying where they from and shit. This, woo, 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 I'm talking every set, black Mexican hoods all up in this damn park. And nobody really tripping at the point. But when they tell us, I guess something's going down, to get up out of here as soon as we, so we got to leave the damn Jesse Owens Park. We walking back down Western and shit. Next thing we know, do, 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 People scat, running out the damn park and shit. So that's the crazy environments I grew up from. And a lot of shit is probably kicked up uh, uh, from, from all them neighborhoods. But uh, salute to my brother Dwyer uh, Jones in the building. Salute my brother. So let me go ahead and get right into this chapter for today. So today's chapter it's going to be chapter seven. Let me change the headline on that one. This is going to be called this. Well, he titled this chapter Muhammad Abdullah. So let me get into that. Thank you for those who come to watch live and also on the playback. And also uh, just to make this reading shit cool, man, that's what I want to do. I man, I can talk big shit and clown, be serious, be comical, uh, be on other intellectual type stuff because we are dynamic people. We ain't stuck in a box. And that's why I always tell people, especially I remember a girl asked me about the content I post on, on Instagram or the way I used to have shows on here. But what is your direction? You should have one direction and be specifically down this. No, I'm not in a fucking box. I'm not boxed in. I'm not singular as a person. I have many interests and shit and many things I like to learn. So that's why I'm, I have a full oration as all people are. But uh, let's go into this. And here we have a super fine gangster motherfucker who was super, uh, super intellectual, but never applied it. But let's go into it. Muhammad Abdullah, the Grey Goose, as the Youth Authority transport bus was affectionately called, rolled through the double sa uh, Sally Port gates at the youth training school under the watchful eyes of those prisoners who worked and the 500 trade jobs behind yet another chain link fence. After meeting the security requirements of the last checkpoint, the Grey Goose chugged forward further into the institution. Once the third fence was open and we rolled through, the expansive sight of the landscape almost took my breath away. I saw the same effect on the faces of a few other prisoners aboard the bus. It looked like a huge college campus or what I thought a college campus would look like from watching room 222 on television. There was a standard football field of plush green grass, 
surrounded by red dirt, surrounded by red dirt, 440 yard track. On one side of the track sat the bleachers and behind them was a boxing gym. On the other side stood another huge gym containing Olympic weights and full and full hardwood basketball court. Adjacent to adjacent to this was a swimming pool. After being locked in the concrete confines of South Central all my life, with the exception of youth camp, seeing such open space of well-kept grass surrounded by a track gym, swimming pool, and bleachers only conjured up beautiful images of college campuses and well-to-do students. But as all things, but as with all things, that which looks good outwardly may be horribly ugly within. The well-kept faces of the youth authorities uh, of the YTS was but a facade for behind the walls of the gym and in their three units that stood around the outer track like mysterious statues on Easter Island, corruption of every kind was rampant and for profit. In 1981, the youth training school held 1,200 prisoners. No one under California law could stay in youth authority past the age of 26. YTS was considered a senior youth authority, a maximum security youth prison. It, comp it comprised three units, each divided into quarters. Each quarter was, a sub was subdivided into halves, and each half was given, oh, each half was again divided into banks or tiers. Every prisoner was assigned to his own cell. Each cell had a sliding door or solid steel with a glass window for observation by the staff. The units were organized so as to meet the individual needs of each prisoner as set forth by the diagnosed researchers designated to individual casework. Each unit had four companies, all instructed alphabetically. One unit housed company A, B, C, D, E, F, and G, H. A, B was for orientation. One had to stay here at least two weeks without going anywhere else but to testing, math, reading, comprehension, and so on. If your grade point average was not up to par, you were made to go to school. If you had, oh, if you did not have your diploma or GED, you had to work half a day and go to school the other half until you got it. CD was there or was where you be, could be trained in fighting fires and then sent out to do easy time at one of the many youth authority camps. EF was for drug abusers and people who, when sentenced, were specifically ordered by a judge to complete the 12 step program as required for release, as a requirement for release. GH was for alcoholics with the same uh, persistence our board recommended stipulations in their file. Unit two, consistent of IJ, KL, MN, and OR was the last unit of specification. IJ was a medical unit for mentally ill prisoners and prisoners with rape charges or with character defects that had led to the charges or an end conviction. KL and MN were young companies, young prisoners, even though maximum security materials were kept to, material were kept together, OR, better known as the Rock, was the whole, one of the strictest maximum security holes outside of Pelican Bay's uh, security housing unit and Merriam's MCU. Once on the rock, you had to practically jump through hoops to get off. Every week a bus came and took prisoners off the rock and into state prison and onto state prison. The rock loomed as the ultimate discipline for those considered fuck ups. Whenever we passed the rock, which was up above KL, we gave sort of a thankful salute. The cool people just nodded respectfully. Unit three was considered the unit to be in S T U V W X Y Z. W X was where all the riders were. 
It had a reputation for everything from race rides to football, dope to weightlifting. It sat above ST, which was a regular company, as was YZ. UV was for those with 500 tread, oh, was those, oh, was for those in 500 tread. There were the upper class sort of folks. Everyone in UV got paid for their, for their work. They kept the institution clean and functioning properly. Everyone wanted to be in 500 trade. The youth training school also had a huge trade line where everything from you, uh, from upholstery to plumbing was taught. Upon completion of the trade line, one was given a certificate. As with most, every institution, correctional facility or penitentiary, Chicanos and New Africans were in the majority. In the Youth Authority, one began to learn about the larger prison culture that touched everyone's lives, including the staff who, after being in the institution so long, began to assume some, some of the characteristics of the prisoners. Lines of race, of national unity that defy political logic and overstanding were clearly drawn in youth authority, which served as a junior college for the larger university of prison. The most blatant was that of the armed forces of Southern Chicanos, Southerners, meaning any land south of Fresno with all Americans. The Americans could have white pride, white pride, white power, swastikas, lightning bolts, 100% honky, and such tattoos all over them, clearly stating they were stone cold racist, and the Chicanos would be more than comfortable in their presence. New Africans allied themselves with the more culture northern Chicanos. The northern and southern Chicanos were, and still are, locked in a very serious war. The film American Me illustrates this. So, like the warring factions of New Africans, the Chicanos were split by geographical boundaries. What's striking is that the division of the two is signified in colors. The, Ch the Northern Chicanos, Norteño Familia, Northern Structure, Fresno Bulldogs, were red flags. The more, uh, the more numerous Southerners, Mexican Mafia, Southern United Razas, and South Side government were blue. The new Africans from Northern California, primarily Oakland, Berkeley, Richmond, San Francisco, and Palo Alto called themselves 415s, which until recently was the area code for most of the Bay Area. As if the Crip, as if the Crip and blood conflict was not complicated enough, Crips do not get along with the 415s, actually. The 415s don't like the new Africans from the 213, the Los Angeles area code, but for G, and that's an old area code. I think we, I don't know if people still carry that old LA area code. I think we moved to 310 and 323, which is, I still maintain that area code. So the Los Angeles area code, but for strategic purposes, they have chosen the Bloods as allies over Crips. So in youth authority, the, gov the ground rules of prison are set. Your friends, your enemies, as a rule, all Americans get along with all North, South, 415s and 213s. This, I believe, is because of their minority status in most institutions. Tribalism was most prevalent amongst New Africans who began as one that split into Crips and Bloods. The Crips, ever the majority, were then plagued, indeed traumatized, by the internal strife of set tripping. There was also struggles within each set uh, for leadership. In prison, beginning the youth authority, sets tried to organize themselves on some level to deal with the new complexities of institutionalization. With this new quest come comes the rise of antagonistic contradictions. Since most leaders were not politically equipped to properly recognize, confront, and resolve the contradictions in organizing the unorganized and relations to the larger society, their efforts usually fail. 
doomed from the off from the outset or were boarded in the early stages by those who opted for the old platform of anarchy. This state of oh, this start and stop process of organization was character was characteristic of most sets there. When I was at when I was at YTS, we began our organizing process when our members swelled beyond 15. Our critical concern, our critical concern was organizing around the larger reality of the war. I had been reading Mario Puzo's The Godfather and was devising a grand scheme for the set based on the Corleone family structure. Never did I take into account that first and foremost, the Italians had a clear sense of who they were. That is, they over, they overstood their heritage and their relations to the world as European people. We, on the other hand, were just crips with no sense of anything before us or of where we were headed. We were trapped behind the vows of culture, ignorance without even knowing it. Yet here I was trying to pattern our set after some established people, Europeans at that. My opposition came primarily from Diamond. It got continually worse until 1983, culminating into my charge of set neglect against Diamond. This prompted a meeting of the entire set. Diamond was, exon was exonerated, but after that, our relationship never recovered. By this time, I had become very egotistical. My reputation had fully ballooned to the third stage, and by definition, I had moved into the security zone, the security zone of OG status. My rep was om omnipresent, totally saturating every circle of gang life, from crash to the courts, from crips to bloods, from juvenile hall to death row. My security had arrived. This, coupled with my newfound curiosity and interest in mafia style gangsterisms made me very hard to approach. By 1983, I was physically the second biggest in the institution, second only to an old friend, Roscoe, the Samoan from Park Village Compton Crips. We were weightlifting partners. We had 21 inch arms and mines were 20 and one quarter. He was a bench press. He was bench pressing 510 pounds, and I was doing 470. I heard after I left that he went uh, that he went considerably higher, 590. I was told my size added to the monster image, and I capitalized on it at every opportunity. We had planned a righteous, we had planned a righteous gangster ceremony of bloodletting for the year of 1983, the year of the eight trade. But 1983 found the set in shambles. Most of our combat troops were locked away, dead or paralyzed by lack of motiv motivations. We found ourselves compensating for this in YTS by vamping, also by vamping on the 60s. We sped the process up. Apart from it being 1983 was the fact that that Opie had just been murdered by the rolling 60s. Caught in a secure driveway, trying to climb over a chain link fence, he was hit once in the side and died waiting for an ambulance. We were in a sense with rage because other than little Spike, who was, oh, who was the uh, darling of the hood, Opie was our uh, was our sort of mascot. He was always uh, he was always filthy and unkempt, which didn't seem to bother him at all. But D and I will always make fun of Opie's appearance and shabbiness. We even had Opie Nash. Oh, we even had the Opie national anthem, which opened, "Where there's fire, there's smoke. Where there's dirt, there's Opie." Opie would just look would just look at us like he felt sorry for us, and D and I would double over and laugh. At it. We take our hats off and place them solemnly over our hearts, looking very serious, and then fall into the Opie national anthem. 
Where there's fire, there is smoke. Where there's dirt, there is oak. We love Opie like a brother. We needed to consolidate a meeting of all 23, of all 23 of us in the institution so we could move simultaneously. There's only feasible place, the only feasible place we could can congregate without the staff detecting our intent was in Muslim service, which was held every Monday night. We knew that the attendance was low and that our move to the service would not be viewed with alarm by the staff. Members who worked as operatives for gang, uh, for gang court, for the gang coordinator, the dreaded Mr. Hernandez. And it's funny, man, that it's 23 of these cats from the same neighborhood. Now I think he's talking about 23, he's talking about 23 of the kids from a trade. That means these kids have been taken off the streets for these violent fucking crimes. That shit was wild as this crip and blood shit began to escalate, man. So continuing with the book, when Little Monster came to YTS from Ventura for whipping a female prisoner, Mr. Hernandez called us both to his office. Little bro was in YZ and I was on the rock. I had been put there as a result of Little Fee from Rolling 60s telling Hernandez that I had instructed a uh, stall, uh, what is that, stagger lead to beat him down, which of course was true. Lil Fee had just come down from DeWitt, uh, from, had just come down from DeWitt uh, Nelson and was trying to be, uh, to, was trying to be hard. When I dissed his set, he surprisingly dissed back, though he was out of, out of the firing, out of the firing range. In fact, he was clear across the front field. The diss was not, uh, was not verbal and no one other than he and I knew it was going on. When I saw him looking in my direction, I flashed the set sign and then still holding my fingers in place, displaying his hood. I put them in my mouth and chewed on them, insinuating that I'll be eating his hood up. He in turn did the same thing to my set, but my gesture was based on fat. His was empty. Nonetheless, he had done it. I would have changed, I would have charged him immediately myself, but he had, but he was in step with his unit, escorted by two off, two staff members and across the field. And I was in step with my unit, company by staff. The chances of getting him were slim, taking into account the distance and the staff coverage. Besides, had I gotten there, how long would the brawl last? Surely not long enough to punish him for the crime of disrespect. In addition, I was a G. That meant I had people to handle this type of thing, no problem. And let me pause there, man, because the other crazy, the thing about Lil Fee, Lil Fee, notorious Lil Fee is also going to be the dude who I, I don't know if Tookie going to bring it up. Lil Fee from Rose 6, he was known for his killing of, I forget the dude who played with the, uh, he played in the NFL. I think he may have been Rams running back with Lil Fee and some cats go put in a hit for some fool at a club trying to trying to stop somebody who was filing a lawsuit for him from um filing a lawsuit against his club because they got injured he put out a hit little fee and them going to this home they go in the wrong house they killed the nfl player's mother i think that was his sister and like the nieces and nephews or some shit and little fee and them was wild y'all remember my teacher was on here not too long ago he was talking about little fee uh, as well he talked about big you when big you was a kid as well but that's what Lil Fee did. Lil Fee is also known for stabbing Tookie when he was in there. Lil Fee was a wild dude. And he's still, matter of fact, he's still serving life. I'll forget. I know I heard somebody talking about Lil Fee. Uh, let me continue on. I sent word to Stag, who was an MM with Lil Fee. The very next day, Stag put an old style gangster whooping on him. Lil Fee informed Hernandez, who got involved in every fight that was gang related of the distance the previous day, and Hernandez locked me up on the rock. Lil Fee was sent back to the DeWitt, Nel to DeWitt Nelson. The next time we will meet, will be over the barrel of a gun. When I got to Hernandez's office, I was surprised to see Lil Bro. I had heard that he was here. I had heard that he was here, but not seen him because I was locked on the rock. Hernandez gave us some, some uh, bullshit 
bullshit ass speech about not wanting to allow two monsters into his institution. I wasn't even paying attention to what he was saying when it when uh oh says when in the course of the uh spill about what what would um he would not tolerate, I jumped up out of my seat and shot it. Fuck it. I'm ready to go to the pen. Mr. Hernandez was shot and sat looking at my bug at my bug eyes. Little bro grabbed my arm and told me, be cool. Sat back down and buried, oh, it says, and burned a hole right to Mr. Hernandez, who now knew that I was beyond his little uh little threats. How could I be uh how could I be cordial with the same man who had locked me up and now sat before me espousing with uh espousing me threats? I was escorted back to the rock without further comment from Mr. Hernandez. Sue so little bro and exited the room. From the rock, I sent word for the meeting in the Muslim service. The following Monday evening, we fell into Muslim service, 23 deep. Besides us, there were seven or eight others, including two Muslim ministers, Muhammad and Hazma. All those staff members escorted them for supervisory coverage, they left soon after the ministers began to speak. On this night, our first night, the Muslims had set up a film on slavery, which held no interest for us. As soon as the lights went off, I began on, I says, I began in on our needed sweep to rid the institution of the 60s. During the course of my talks to the homies, the lights flicked on and the film projector was turned off. We sat up from our hunched positions and were faced with a very angry Hosma. Check this out, brothers, began Hosma, who stood before us in a black ro- in a black robe over black combat boots and a leather jacket. Y'all disrespecting our service. Over here, over here rapping among yourselves like little women. Wait a minute, man. I said in a quick defense of our status. We ain't trays. We ain't no women. Yeah, well, that that uh, well, well, the way y'all, nah, man, fuck that. We gangsters. Well, if y'all ain't gonna uh watch the movie, then y'all can leave. Oh yeah, I said, standing up and slowly turning in the direction of my homeboys. Let's bail. I stalked off without a backwards glance, followed by the troops. Once outside the Pentecostal church, which is where Islamic service. Uh, services were held. We made our way to the trade line, smoke break area, and stood around. All at once, all at once, powerful lights hit us from the tower overlooking the facility. And moments later, institutional cars and vans sped towards us, stopping within inches of our gathering. We were put on the fence and brick walls surrounding the smoke break area and searched by irate staff members. When asked what we were doing out of bounds, we said that the Muslims said we, we uh, could leave. I was taken to the rock while the others were locked in their cells pending an explanation by the Muslims who had supposedly let us out of, out of service without proper escort. The next day we found out that the Muslims had, in fact, backed up our stories. And with the exception of me, all the homies were taken off lockdown. The next week, while I was in the infirmary waiting room, just waiting to, oh, just wasting time out of my cell, Muhammad came through. At first, I was a bit reluctant to approach him because of the disrespect issue, but I felt obligated to say something because they had backed us when the staff had asked them about the incident. I motioned him over. What's up, man, I asked, not knowing how he would respond. Don't remember me? Yeah, he said, I remember you. Yeah, well, I just want to apologize for disrupting your uh, service last week and say thank you for backing us up on our statement. Yeah, I hear you, but actually, y'all didn't disrupt our service at all. As far as the pigs trying to uh, lock y'all up, nah, we ain't gonna contribute to that. Righteous, I said, noting that Muslim style of speech was straight out of the 1960s. 
He was about six feet even with very dark, shiny, well-kept blackness. He wore a full beard, gold, gold glasses, and a turban. His dress code was militant. He was a black Ayatollah. Isn't your name uh, Monster Cody? Asked Muhammad. Yeah, I responded. From A. Trey, right? Right. Insula, Insu Allah, I think that's how you say it. I'll be dealing with some of your older home, homeboys, Rafer, Baycott, Excon. You know them? Yeah, they're my OG homies, I said with pride. Was all them brothers with you last week from A Trey too? Yeah, we are 23 deep here. Why your brothers fall to the service? Oh, says, why your brothers fall to the service like that? Huh? I said as if I didn't uh, understand his question. I didn't know if I should tell him the truth or not. If I said we were we were having a meeting, uh, he might feel that we were really uh, that we really were disrespecting his service. Give me one second, one second. I got a few pages to go that we're disrespecting his service. You know, like why was y'all so thick? Somebody got oh somebody uh got killed on the bricks. He saw that I was perplexed and didn't want to say too much, so he talked. So uh he talked on. You brothers look unified and strong. Inshallah, why don't you come and check out our service tonight? Nah, I ain't into no religion or nothing. Well, here, read this. And if you ever feel like checking us, come out. Come on by. You're welcome. Righteous, I replied, looking down at the at the pamphlet I uh, he given me, entitled Message to the Oppressed. We shook hands and parted company. That night in the uh, cell, I read the pamphlet, which began with the quote by Malcolm's, out of frustration and helpless and hopelessness, our young people have reached the point of no return. We no longer endorse patience and turning back or oh, turning the other cheek. We assert the right to self of self-defense by whatever means necessary and reserve the right of maximum retaliation against our racist oppressors. No matter what the odds against us are, I went on to list foods, clothing, and shelters as immediate aims of the struggle and land and independence as the sought after objectives. The pamphlet was not as religious as I thought it would be. I have been so conditioned to believe that religion was synonymous for passivity. From the Christian teachings to the people of color, that I simply took for granted. That Islam was like Christianity and Christianity in this light. The material ended with another quote by Malcolm X. From here on in, if we must die anyway, we will die fighting back and we will not die alone. We intend to see that our racist oppressors also get a taste of death. The language was heavy and I was impressed by it. Of course, I was trying to figure out how to fit my enemies into this language <laughs> for the word oppressor had little meaning to me then. Although I was like every other person of color on this planet oppressed, I didn't know it. Told myself the next week I was going to go and see just what was happening over there. During the day before the service, I read and reread the pamphlet. I had trouble clarifying words like struggle, revolutionary, jihad, and col colonialism, but I kept on reading it. It gave me a certain feeling, a slight tingle, and a longing sense of curiosity. Finally, the next day fell, and I found myself walking down the ramp off the rock over towards the chapel that held Islamic service. When I got there, was greeted by a brother named L.C., who was also a prisoner who lived on Company S.T. There were about nine people altogether. After they went through their prayers, Muslims read a short sara from the Holy Quran and then closed it. Standing there thoughtfully for a moment, he played lightly in his beard, and then, as suddenly as thunder, 
he began a sharp tirade about the U.S. government. Brothers, it's incumbent upon you as a male youth to learn your obligation to the oppressed masses who are being systematically crushed by the wicked government of the United States. They already know of your potential to smash them. So they have deliberately locked you up in the concentration camp. This concentration camp. Now heated up, he began to pace the length of the church. Inshallah Allah, I think I'm saying that right. You would not be sidetracked from the miss from this uh from your mission. You are young warriors who are destined to be free, but you must be prepared to jihad till death. I was totally awestruck by his strength and language, not to mention his sincerity. He talked about the government's deliberate efforts to rid the world of people of color, black males in particular. But all, I mean, he says all, but the simplest things went right over my head. But what I was able to grasp slapped me hard across the face with such force that I got goosebumps. Damn, this shit must be real. It seemed too heavy to be made up. And if it didn't, all it says, and if he didn't know what he was talking about, how was he able to explain what I had been through in my in, in home, in school, in the streets, and with the law? No, this had to be real. When the services when the services were over, I lifted my hand, I lift oh sorry, I lifted myself up and floated to my cell totally high on Muhammad's revolutionary speech. The weeks followed, the weeks following the service, I must have read message to the oppressed 30 times. All I thought about was hearing Malcolm, Malcolm, uh, sorry, all I thought about hearing was Muhammad's blows. On Wednesday, I got some devastating news. Crazy Keith from Harlem came for a visit and told me Trayball was dead. What? I said in utter disbelief, yeah, Lil Trey Ball just told me, Lil Trey Ball just told me that Cuz shot himself in the head playing Russian roulette. Where Lil Trey Ball at? I asked. I seen Cuz on a visit. Damn, I felt I felt that total loss. I wasn't really, I wasn't ready to hear that. Not Trey Ball. I had dealt with other deaths in one piece, getting solace out of being able to strike back. But here on the rock, there was no striking back, no drugs, no loud music to put on to uh to put me in a trance, no revenge, nothing of the sort. Just me and myself. It was almost impossible to deal with the reality of him being dead, gone, never to be seen again. All the good times came rolling up on my mental screen. Times when Trey Ball will act as mediator in disputes amongst the homies, using his influence to mend breaks in the clique, or using his per, uh, persuasive, or using his persuasion to, to recruit yet another homie. Ball gave us foresight, hindsight, and deep-seated feelings of righteous work. I couldn't imagine how oh, him. First, we lost eight ball, and now Trey Ball, symbolically, the set, A Trey, had been castrated by the removal of its balls. The eight and the three. I cried like a baby for hours. Not for Trey Ball, but for the set. The hood was dying. Didn't people see it like that? Our symbols were falling, and no one seemed to understand the significance of this. My nerves were totally, were in total disarray. What to do? I said, what do you do when your homie commits suicide? Who do you strike? Who do you strike at? Who is to blame? We all play Russian roulette. That mindless game of stupidity sadly taken into, uh, taken as courage. Fortunately, our chambers clicked empty against the pings of the hammer. But for Trey Ball, it was a full well, it was a full train chamber. Man, that's shit crazy. From what I was able to gather, Trey Ball along with two 
our three other homegirls and two members of the Compton Crips were in the shack. Trey Ball's brick back house getting high. Trey Ball started playing Russian roulette with the 38 snub nose. One round in the chamber. Quick spin, put the barrel to the temple, and click our boom. After several successive, successive attempts are unsuccessful, depending on player's disposition, and I don't know what Trey Ball's mindset was the particular day, he became bored with the game. He exited the shack, went into the house. While he was gone, thinking he was, uh, thinking he was through with the roulette, Someone put five more rounds in the chamber. When Trey Ball re re-entered the shack, he immediately picked up the gun, put it to his head, squeezed the trigger, and boom. No one had time to tell, oh, no one had time to tell the barrel was, to tell him the barrel was full. Everyone fell, uh, fled the scene. Tragedy has no mercy. Our first thoughts was foul play. My initial instinct was to kill everybody who was there, including those from Compton. Later, I knew this was an irrational call based on emotion, emotionalism. It's called bitter. I was remained bitter the rest of the week. When Tamu and my sister, Kendit, came to visit my brother and me on Sunday, I told them about Muhammad and the way he talked. I asked bro to accompany me Monday night to service, and he agreed to. On Monday, Muhammad did as he had the week before. Only this time, he spoke more about the Black Panther Party and its threats to the U.S. government. Seeing me and little bro there, he intentionally expounded on the lives of George and Jonathan Jackson, both members of the party. Jonathan was murdered in a heroic attempt to liberate three prisoners, including the Saladad brothers, of which his brother, Conrad, Comrade George, was one. Comrade George was assassinated the following year in a, oh, in a uh, bongo attempt to escape from uh, San Quentin. How old are you, Muhammad asked, pointing at Lil Monster. 17, replied Lil Bro. Jonathan Jackson was 17 when he uh, walked into Marion County Courthouse and took the judge and DA hostage. He paused for a minute for effect. What set you from, Muhammad asked me. A Trey Gangster, I replied. George Jackson was a field marshal for the Black Panther Party. He was 18 when he was, cap when he was captured. He was given one year to life for a $70 gas station robbery. He served 11 years before he was killed by pigs. He was 29 years old. He turned to Little Monster. What you in here for? For murder. Who you killed? Some 60s. Black people, Muhammad shouted. Yeah, but George Jackson corrected. George Jackson corrected. Not killed, corrected three pigs. Well, oh, it says George Jackson corrected, not killed, corrected. Three pigs and two Nazis before himself was murdered. Muhammad seemed possessed. This is what I'm saying. This is what I'm trying to tell you. As you kill each other, the real enemy is steadily killing you. Your generation has totally turned inwards and is now self destructive. You are less of a threat when you fight one another, you dig? We sat upright, clinging to his words. Jonathan knew chemistry, demolition, martial arts. He was a man child, a revolutionary. He felt responsible. He felt, oh, sorry, where am I at? Boom, boom, man child. He felt responsible for his future, for the future of his people. We sat there stunned by the parallel between us and George and Jonathan. What made us sit up and take note of what Muhammad was saying about our self-destructive behavior was that he never talked down to us, always to us. He didn't divide, what's up, hold on.
Okay. Quiet. He, he didn't like, he didn't like what we were doing, but he respected us as young warriors. He never once told us to disarm. His style of consciousness raising was in total harmony with the way in which we had grown up in our communities in this country, on this planet. Muhammad's lessons were local, national, and international. Let me get this quick sip of water. It's a good part. Let me say what's up to the brothers rolling in. Salute to my brother Mark Freeland. Shallow saying hello to Shadow saying hello to everyone. Queen Unique Don in the building. We got the heart and flame. Sylvester in the building saying what's good. What's up, my brother? All right, continuing on. Um, so I put so I put the word out that all Crips should come uh should come to Muslim service and hear Muslim talk. Within three weeks, attendance increased from nine to twenty-seven to forty and Finally, to 80, the staff became alarmed, asking questions and even sitting on some of the services, trying to grasp our sudden attractions to Islamic services. They never caught it. Islam is a way of life, just like banging. We could relate to what Muhammad was saying, especially when he spoke about jihad sh struggle. Of course, we heard what he wanted us as records. We heard what we wanted to hear. We knew that Islam, our revolution, was not a threat to us as warriors. Muhammad didn't seek to make us passive or weak. On the contrary, he encouraged us to stand firm, stay on, stay black. He encouraged us to shoot one, he encouraged us not to shoot one another if possible, but to never hesitate to correct the pig who transgressed against the people. After every service let out, it was common sight to see 50 to 80 new African youths mobbing back to their unit, shouting jihad to death and death to the oppressor. The Protestant, oh, so the Protestant following total, totally evaporated. Reverend Jackson could not figure out where his constituents had gone. In these times, gang conflicts involving New Africans were at an all-time low. Ms. Hernandez began to pull on the strings of his informants, which, without fail, led him to me. One day, he called me into his office for a fact-finding check. He offered me a seat. I declined. He then began his little probe. So, Mr. Scott, or is it Abdul or Alibaba? I said nothing. Yes. Well, anyway, I have called you in here because it is my understanding that you have been trying to subvert the institutional security. The term institutional security is so far reaching that whenever there is nothing to lock up, to lock a prisoner down or harass them for staff, correction officers, and most any figure of authority in any institution will pull out this ambiguous term. It is precisely this wording that had that has me locked, oh, says that has me locked deep within the bowels of Pelican Bay today. I'm a threat and proud of it. If I wasn't a threat, I'll be doing something wrong. Institution of what, I ask yet not familiar with the terminology. Security, Scott, security. Man, you tripping. No, Scott, you were tripping, he yelled, slapping both hands hard on the table. I don't know what you're talking about. I answered with, bl with, blank stare, with a blank stare. Oh, you don't know, huh? What do you, oh, so, so, well, how do you explain 23A trays, 14 Hoovers, 11 East Coast, and a lesser amount of other bangers cropped up in the Muslim church for the past month, huh? Explain that. Man, I ain't explaining shit. Oh no, well how about if I keep your badass on the rock forever, huh? How about that? I'm already, I've already been there two months for some shit that didn't involve me. You are a damn liar. You ordered that boy Layton to jump on Cox and you've been involved in a host of other shit. So don't tell me what you ain't done. 
you know what, Mr. Hernandez? Do what you got to do. I said low and slow to let him know that I wasn't hardly giving a fuck what he was stressing on. Yeah, I'll do that. I'll do just that. But you remember this when you go up there, up for parole. Can I leave now? I asked, bored with his threats. Actually, the rock wasn't all that bad. I ate all my meals in a cage, showered every day, and came out once for an hour, usually in the morning. I was able to have my radio and a few tapes. At that time, I was exploring the blues. Jimmy Reed was my favorite. I still got my re weekly visits, though I couldn't decide who I wanted to have come. And YTS, they allowed prisoners to have only one female on their visiting list, <clears throat> other than mothers and sisters. Tamu really was not my first uh, choice. China was. But she didn't have any mobility to be out there every week and riding the bus was suicidal. So I took her off my uh, visiting list and replaced her with uh, Ayana, who was also from the hood. Her mother had moved her out to Pomona to get her out of the gang environment. And she now lived uh, in close proximity to YTS. Our, visit, our visits went like clockwork, but eventually we grew tired of each other. So I took her off my list. For a short time, I replaced Ayana with Feliciana, with Feliciana, Trey Ball's sister. This didn't work out too well either because she wanted me to stop game banging and I wasn't having it. I was not giving up my career for no female. So I ended up putting Tamu back on the list. As long as I got my, uh, as long as I got my visits, I could keep, oh, I can, oh, as long as I got my visits and can keep my music, The Rock wasn't, wasn't uh, shit. In my cell on The Rock, I reread for the hundredth time the message to the oppressed. Malcolm came on strong. We declare our rights on this earth to be a man, to be a human being, to be given the rights of a human being in this society, on this earth, in this day which we intend to bring into existence by any means necessary. As I read on, I felt the words seeping deeper into me, their powers coursing through my body, giving me strength to push on. I was changing, I felt it. For once I didn't challenge it or see it as being a threat to, my, to the established moors of the hood. Though, though of course it was. Muhammad's teaching, teachings corresponded with my conditioning of being re repressed on the rock. Never could I've been touched by such reading or by such teachings in the streets. The prison setting, although repressive, was a bit too free. But on the rock, the illusion of freedom vanished, and it is, and it oh, and in its place was the harsh actuality of oppression and the very real sense of powerlessness over destiny because there was no shooting wars to concentrate on. Your worst enemy was easily replaced by the figure presently doing you the most harm. In prison, that figure is more than often, is more often than not an American, an American who locks you in a cage, counts, counts you to make sure you had an escape, hold a weapon to on hold a weapon on you, and in many instances, shoots you. Add this to the fact that most of us grew up in an 80% New African community police are occupied by 85% American pig force that is clearly antagonistic to any male in the community displacing this, displaying this antagonist, antagonism at every opportunity by any means necessary with all the buttes, force, and, statist and statistic imaginations they can muster. It was quite easy then for Muhammad's teachings to hit me in the heart. However, my attractions to the fact to the facts involving our national oppressions was grounded in emotionalism 
and eight years of revolutionary development in crypt culture could hardly be rolled back by one pathlet and a few trips to uh, Islamic service. But I did, oh, but I did feel the strength. I called off the move on the 60s after Trayvon killed himself. Everyone asked why, but I really had no answers. I told them that we handled it in the office oh, that we handled in a little while. Stag Lee was my neighbor on the rock. He and I would talk through the small hole in the wall. I sent him over the message to the oppressed pamphlet and solicited a response from him about the content. Cause I said, bending down so as to talk through the hole. What do you think about the uh, about that paper I sent over there? I don't know. Some of these words too hard for me cause, but I can see that this is some powerful shit. Well, what you uh could I says well, what you could catch? What do you think? Cause really, I think Muhammad is some kind of terrorist or something. Stag, you tripping? Muhammad ain't no terrorist. Shit, Muhammad is down for us. Who he acts? The set? Hell no, nah, nigga. Black people. Oh, cause fuck all that. Cause soon as he gone, as soon as he gonna be telling us to stop banging and shit. Stag, stag. I try to slow him down. No, nah, cause I can't, I can't see me being no Muslim. I can't see it. They be standing on the corner selling beans. I'll be selling pies and shit. Do you know how long one of us would live standing on the corner? Not even in our hood, monster. Let me catch a sissy. I mean, he dissing somebody from sixties, uh, Muslim or not, and I'ma blow that nigga. I'ma blow that nigga up. I don't know, homie. I just feel there's something there. Yeah, motherfucker, bean pie. Stagley answered and broke out laughing. <laughs> Stall it out, cuz. I said, feeling myself getting angry. Monster, you ain't thinking about being no Muslim. Is you, cuz? Don't do it. Mahanda cool and everything, but cuz, you monster Cody. Ain't nothing gonna let you live in peace. Plus the set needs you, cuz. Here, cuz. Stag had rolled up the pamphlet and was pushing it through the hole. Nah, cuz, I ain't thinking about turning on Muslim. I'm just saying that what Muhammad be stressing is real. Right, right? Well, I'm going to step back and get some uh, Z's. I'll rap to you later. Three minutes. Three minutes. I lay on my bed with the roll up pamphlet on my chest and thought about Stag, uh, thought about what Stag had said. You monster Cody, ain't nobody gonna let you live in peace. The set needs you. My young consciousness screamed back in an attempt to exert and to exert it. Uh, oh, what is that? To exert itself. Who is monster Cody? I am monster Cody. I'm a person, a young man, a black man. Anything else? No, nor that I know of. What is monster Cody? A crip. An A tray, a rolling 60s killer, a black man, black man, black man, black man. The words reverberated again and again. Nobody gonna let you live in peace. We ain't gonna let you live in peace. Black man, black man, black man. Why? My consciousness shot it back. Why? I have no answers. The confusion gave me a headache. I knew that I was reaching a crossroads, but I didn't know how to handle it. Should I accept it or reject it? In a perverted sort of way, I enjoyed being Master Cody. I lived for the power surge of playing God, having the power of life and death in my hands. Nothing I, nothing I knew could compare with riding in a car with three other homeboys with guns, knowing that they were as deadly and courageous as I was, to me, at that time in my life, this was power. It made me feel responsible for either killing someone or letting them live. The thoughts of controlling something sub substantial like land never occurred to me. The thought of responsibility for the warfare of my daughter or nation 
for the welfare of my daughter and nation. Sorry about that. New Africa never crossed my mind. I was only responsible to my hood and my homeboys. Now I was being subjected to a wider reality that I had never, that I had ever, that had ever known. Sorry about that. Then I heard it. As I was struggling with the dilemma, I grasped the point that Muhammad was trying to make. When you were born, you were born black. That's all. Then later on, you turned crip, did? In this light, I found clarity. But I asked myself, what was Muhammad really asking us? Did I have to be a Muslim to be black? I surmised that it was like, the, like being a crip or blood as opposed to being a hook or civilian. Where I come from, where I came from, in order to be down, you had to be in. Did I have to be in? That is a Muslim to be down with blackness. Surely much thoughts and eternal debate had to go, had to go into this issue. My thing was this. I didn't believe there was a God. I had no faith in what I couldn't see, feel, taste, hear, or smell. All my life, I had seen the power of life and death in the hands of men and boys. If I shot at someone and hit, and hit him and he died, who took his life, me or God? Was it predestined that on this day, at this time, I was specifically pushed this guy out of existence. I never believed that. I believed that I hunted him, caught him, and killed him. I had lived in too much disorder to believe that there was an actual design to the world. So I had a problem with believing in anything other than myself. My interest here was drawn by the militancy of Malcolm X and Muhammad not by the spirituality of Islam. The first book I got was Soul on Ice by Eldridge Cleaver. Most of it was too hard to grasp, but what I did get was militant and strong. I found this was my preference. Give me one second. Salute to my brother Cletus in the building. Rights bro in the building. Salute my brothers. All right, let me finish on. I was subsequently taken off the rock and put back into unit through in company UV. While attending school for my GED, I met a brother named Walter Brown. Bro, who worked at YTS as a teacher but functioned better as a guiding light, had been a prisoner himself in the 1960s. He was stern but flexible and held great influence over most of us who was considered OGs. Brown was militant but responsible. Not to imply that militants are irresponsible, but Brown was specifically responsible for the upbringing of us, young, new Africans. His degree of effectiveness can be measured by the fact that he was designated to teach parole classes. They gave him access to prisoners for one week, one hour a day, before the, oh before they were paroled. Damn. Hell they break bump dropping. This this skimpy time frame could not possibly have helped prisoners deal with the multi complex phenomenon of phenomenon of society. Most of what was taught was useless, old institutional garbage that was not applicable to the streets. Brown, however, was beyond that and taught hardcore reality politics that drew those of us who listened closer to, to the brink of consciousness. Some of us who Brown felt had potential would stop by his class long before pre-parole and sit and listen to him talk about the raw reality of America. Cody Brown would say, these white folks ain't playing, man. They will lock you up, lock you up, I mean, lock you down, lock you in just like they have locked you out of this society. If you haven't got any marketable skills to sustain an, ec an economy of your own, man, your chances of survival are slim. 
you are high risk living, actually just existing. You young man, black, unskilled, strong, you smoke cigarettes? No, nah, just bow. Well, that's good enough. You use drugs, you drink. And to top it off, you game banging. You game bang. Man, how are you gonna make it? Man, I don't know. Brown like Muhammad had a great impact on my development through though it took a few years to appreciate the contributions. The strongest new African man I knew, oh the strongest new African man I had known up until that time were bangers. Verbalizing not an issue. Shoot first and let the victims' relatives ask questions later. Guns were our tools of communication. If we like you, you weren't shot. If you go with any length, oh, says, and we go any length to shoot whoever, whoever dislikes you. If you were not liked, you were hunted. If necessary, and shot, period. Instantaneous communication. That's all I had known for years. Words, I thought, could never take the place of a gun to communicate, to communicate like or dislike. But here I was, totally absorbed in the spoken word of Muhammad and Browns, who, oh, and Browns and written word of Malcolm X. Each emotional lash of Tanyamont, tan, uh, damn, I know I'm jacking this word up, tan, uh, tantamount to the uh, resounding echoes of gunfire. But unlike gunfire, no one was killed. This was my first encounter with brothers who could kill with words. Their words were not mere talk either. Actions follow in the wake of their theories and their, uh, and their presence demanded respect long before their words were spoken. On Monday night, we fell to Islamic service to find another Muslim there. In appearance, this cat was totally out of sync with the Muslims we had known. First of all, he had a jerry curl, which was dripping juice onto his collar and the shoulders of his members only jacket, which was black and colorless and collarless. He wore gray uh, double knit slacks and black penny loafers, standing approximately five feet, four inches and weighing a meager 120 pounds. He was the opposite of Muhammad. As soon as we had taken in his dress and fried hair dripping, uh, dripping nuclear waste, we knew he had been under. We knew he uh, we had been undermined. Where's Muhammad at? I asked, walking up on uh, says walking up on him. Oh, well, he began stammering, obviously intimidated by my size. Mr. Muhammad was suspended by the California Department of Corrections Youth Board and restricted from ent entering the institution until further notice. What? Sorry, fellas, but Maha, sorry. Yes, you see, man, we want Muhammad. You don't even look like no real Muslim. Says, where are you from? Who sent you? Please, please, he said, raising both hands like a, ja like a Jack victim. If you all sit down, I will explain everything to you. Please just have a seat. We moved slowly and reluctantly to our seats, murmuring, fuck that. And this dude is fake under our breaths. Once we were seated, it was apparent that the Muslim felt even more intimidated by standing in front of 80 irate youth demanding an explanation for the sudden removal of our teacher. He begun with Assalamualaikum, alaikum, and not one of us responded with Walaikum Salam. Why should we? He wanted us to be peaceful with him, but we had no intentions of bidding him peace until full explanation was brought forth about the removal of Muhammad Abdullah. The Muslim extracted a white handkerchief, I mean, a white kerchief from his pocket and wiped the sweat mixed with jerry curl juice from his uh, brows. I am George Muhammad, and I have been sent by the American Muslims mission. My job is not to teach you 
revolution. But Ah Islam, Mr. Muhammad Abdullah, was a formator of violence and separating. He was, man, fuck you, came a voice from the back immediately followed by a ball pen piece, by a, a ball, a ball, a piece of paper. We live in violence, says LC, one of the original members of the service before we came. Always have, always have, and by the definition of ghetto, we already live in separation. Muhammad did not teach us violence and separation. He taught us self-defense and nationalism. And anyway, our Islam teaches, teaches us by way of Holy Quran that it is our duty as Muslims to fight oppression wherever it's assault or wherever it's assault us, wherever it assaults us in the world. Yes, but now ain't no, oh, says, but nah, ain't no yes. But see, cause you ain't right. I heard Muhammad talk about you one day. Yeah, yeah, that's right. He taught us, he taught us about how you be looking like us, talking like us and living with us, but all the time you've been working with the oppressor. Yep, we already up on you. Your name ain't no George Muhammad. Your name is Uncle Tom. Get that motherfucker yell someone from the left of me. And we all rose and began to advance on Tom, who stood bugged eye and motionless. Just before he was seized, the door to the chapels burst open and staff and full riot gear came rushing in, came rushing to his rescue. We were all sent back to our cells and put on CTQ, confined into quarters. During which time I received a letter from Muhammad. His letter was my first lesson in counterintelligence, intelligence uh, activity. And the letter goes, this pig sent the Negro preacher to gather intelligence on me. He climbed in an air conditioning vent and taped several of our services. He has always been our worst enemy, unfortunately, for the Uncle Tom is so hard to detect among us. I would not be coming back to YTS for some time, if ever. But I will, but I'll, oh sorry, but I will always stay in contact with you. Ishla Allah says, don't be deceived by those who look like us, but think like the oppressor. I swung by, oh, <clears throat> I was stunned by the reality of Muhammad's letter, by the prophecies of his, don't be deceived by those who look like us, when just this week I had witnessed the undermining of our services by the institution. I passed Muhammad's letter around to those who were responsible for informing their troops. For those who had a problem reading, took it upon myself to explain what had happened. Attendance as Islam, at Islamic services under the guidance of Uncle Tom fell completely. No one attended. So Tom packed up and left because of what had been, oh, because but what we had found out about Reverend Jackson spying on us, <clears throat> no one attended his services either. As for the staff bursting in and rescuing Uncle Tom he was wired. I later found out the staff had anticipated such a response. My consciousness about the larger enemy was being raised bit by bit. Why wouldn't someone want us to learn about who we really are? Is our knowledge of self so threatening that such measures as sending a Christian preacher into an air con uh, conduit are necessary to hinder its attainment? Salute my folks. K Sims in the building. Salute my brother. I said salute to myself in the chat from the Shy Town. Salute, bro. Muhammad and I kept contact, and he sent me a and he sent me a lot of literature, literature, mostly Islamic, but always Afrocentric. The Banga mentality was still uh, uh, uppermost in my mind, as demonstrated in my everyday relation, relations with most people. But questions of right and wrong now came to my mind immediately after every action I took. 
Muhammad had made a tremendous difference in my life, but was barely noticeable then, but cannot be overlooked today. My time in YTS after the closing of Islamic services continued in a fashion characteristic of prison life. To occupy my time, I had structured a daily routine that gave me little opportunity to be blue about confinement. It was 1983, and I wanted to make a statement for the set somehow, some way, but I didn't want to do it in a physical matter, which seemed uncharacteristic of me. Actually, it was uncharacteristic of Monster. Diamond, Superman, and I decided to get tattoos for 1983. I wanted mines on my neck and clear view of all to see. This I knew would be a status symbol, a relative, oh, as relatively, as relatively few new Africans had tattoos on their necks at the time. Today, it's hard to find a banger whose neck isn't written on advertising his or her particular allegiance. In 1983, it was unpopular to have your set written across your neck. But hell, was I into this for popularity or was I committed for life? For most, for most I mean, so I'm adding words, my all out commitment for life would, if I live long enough, bring about popularity as I was already experiencing. But with a tray written across my neck, it would be an everlasting bond. In Black August 1983, I had the tattoo put on my neck. Superman had his mother's name put on his neck. Diamond had some shading done on his back. Against the lightness of my skin, against the lightness of my skin and the thickness of my neck, the tattoo stood out as a beam and testimonial of my lifelong commitment to the hood. One staff member said something adverse about it, but most people didn't care. I felt content about it. And to be, that's all that mattered. Not long after I received the tattoo, I got more depressing news from the hood. Seaball, who had been in the hood for, for years, had shot and killed Trey Stone, man. From what I was able to gather, it was over a cassette tape stolen out of Seaball's car. But after doing a bit more research, I uncovered a possible link in the relationship with a female whose brother was from the hood. It was my understanding that Seaball was jealous of Stone's flirtations with the female and that he only used the tape issue as camouflage. Supposedly, Stone was confronted on the north side by Seaball, <clears throat> who was armed with a 32 caliber revolver, as Stone had grown too large for Seaball to fight. When Seaball asked for his missing tape, <clears throat> Stone became belligerent. Seaball then fired one, one round at point blank range into Stone's torso. Stone fell to the ground and said, oh, cuz he shot me, as if he could not believe it. He died thereafter. Seaball turned himself in and received eight years. Now, the debate was about what to do with Seaball. Trey Stone was, Trey Stone was high level of a combat soldier and was loved deeply by those who Oh, says by those who fought for who he fought for are in beside Seaball, while not a combat soldier, had been in service to the uh, set for years, much longer than Stone. Those of us in combat in the combat wing who favored Stone were calling for on site execution of Seaball, while the voices of traditionalists in their armchair postures rang just as loudly as the forgiveness of Seaball for his slaying. Trey Stone, a bully, the set remind, uh, says the set remained divided over this for quite some time. Even today, there are those on both poles of the issue still debating what right, what's uh, right and what's wrong. I have let, I have, oh, I have let it rest. Stone was 18 years old. 
I was paroled out of YTS on March 7th, 1984. Mons and Tamu were there to pick me up. Little bro and I had been at YTS for one year. That's all I got for chapter seven, folks. We'll continue to chapter eight, which is going to be Tamu, which is his baby mother. So we'll go to chapter eight, which is a chapter about his baby mother. We'll see what goes on with that. And getting close to ending this book. This book is almost over. And I'll be getting my turkey book should be here by tomorrow. And I'll be going into that book next. And let me see. This is going to be a pretty long chapter tomorrow. So we'll get right into it, man. Thank you all for coming through. Salute to Diamond Newman and Bill and Salute. But uh, that's all I got, folks. We'll catch you guys on the next one, man. Peace out. Let me end this with one of the videos once again. And I like the way he gives these breakdowns into what led into the life and, you know, his maturation to this crazy ass dude. But uh, let's check it out. Peace, y'all. began with me there, the organized crime mentality. Because it really wasn't revolutionary yet. It was organized crime still. It was, um, I started saying, damn, I, I had been, I think I was having like an epiphany because like, like I said, I had been introduced through Tookie and them, through y'all antics, through y'all culture as a crib before sets would even, like, you know what I mean? There were clicks, but there weren't sets. You feel me? And so then when my set became, it was like, they gave me a reason to set trip. You feel me? And the more you put a label in front of you, the more you'll cling to it as not only strength, but as a excuse why you don't have to do nothing. Or he might be a crip, but he's from such and such a hood. Or yeah, yeah, he a crip, but I don't fuck with them dudes. Or yeah, he, he a crip, but he ain't no gangster. Man. Or he from neighborhood. But see, the thing is, when the 60s would be at parties with us, and we'd be at parties with the Hoovers, and we'd be hollering our hood, it wasn't no antagonistic contradiction there. The contradiction was pliable. Yes. You from 60s and I'm from Main Trade and you from Hoover. But we all Crips. That's the strongest point. You feel me? These exist inside this Crip. That's what makes this shit so fucking hard. And you can't dance like me, fool. You start sea walking. And, I mean, it's just, it's friendly competition. But then um, when um, friends become enemies, it's. Uh, it's dangerous because, um, you, you know, man, man, I know this dude. I ate at his house. Now y'all want to shoot this dude's house up? And his mother's in there? I mean, shit like that. You know, dilemmas, dilemmas. You start running across, when you see this dude, you know this dude's name just came up in some of your homie shit. He might have been involved on some fight got killed. And you see him, but you and this dude grew up from the sandbox. And use the sledding pads. It's just like war is elastic, man. It's uh, politics are elastic. Love is elastic. That shit, it, 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 it stretches and it accommodates. You know what I mean? Like, like when the crack epidemic came, and um, and um, we went from being broke and piecing up on a court and having a stolen car getting two or three dollars worth of gas and somebody's legitimate car drive all day or having a stolen car we went from that to having an abundance of shit and so the homies who had the most the, the homies who didn't have were gonna rob them so they didn't come around so when they didn't come around the homies who didn't have nothing feel like the homies abandoned them now they really after them. but the homies who are balling will unite with anybody from any hood that got the same amount of money as him. It's about the war on poverty. But it's a Ponzi scheme. Because they ain't kicking nothing back down. They going further up. And will close the door and weld the shut on you. Dudes you grew up with. That money, when the money came, it created classism. It created capitalism in the hood. It created an economic disparity that wasn't just between adults and youth. Like when I was youth, when I was young, 
only adults could be in, in the drug game. What no young dealers. Everybody, you had to buy your commercial weed, four finger bags, and the wax bag with all the seeds from an adult. You know what I mean? Wasn't no kids running around with, with coke in their pocket or, or heroin in their pocket or pills. It wasn't like that. And, and then certain areas got certain drugs. I'm so glad that in my area, heroin didn't come through there.